BBC Radio York, Sarah Irwin with that report. So negotiations start today. It's now time for the EU's chief negotiators and our government to sit around a table and try to agree a deal for us leaving the EU. So are we prepared? A big question, that, because there has been a lot of distraction. Charlotte O'Brien is with me. She is a lecturer at the York Law School and an expert on EU constitution. Good morning, Charlotte. Good morning. Do we know what to expect going in there? I mean, this has never happened before. <laughs> no, quite. Uh, we don't know what to expect. It is a completely new situation. Um, Article 50 has existed since um, the creation of the Treaty of Lisbon, but, of course, nobody has tried to use it before. Um, and so there's a degree to which the EU, as much as we, are making it up as they go along. Um, I mean, that said, they have made attempts to uh, to at least demonstrate pre- preparation from, um, from the point where we no- made notification at the end of March. So they've published some guidelines as to how they see the negotiation should go and a series of... Uh, directives, negotiation directives, setting out exactly what they believe the sequencing should be, what the order in which the different issues should be discussed. And that proved quite controversial uh, when when they were released in May. And we had uh, David Davis suggesting that there would be uh, something of a battle about the order in which topics would be discussed. Um, But it seems reports were coming in through the BBC on Friday that the UK has effectively accepted the sequence that the EU has laid down, possibly because the UK has just not been in a great position to present its alternative Mm, plan. mm. You know, we don't really have much of a formulated plan. There's nothing really been presented to us. And we don't know whether that's because uh, of the desire of the cloak of secrecy or if it just doesn't really exist. So how how well prepared can the UK be then in that in that case? In these circumstances? Well, it's not really presenting itself well as particularly prepared. As I say, there's a lot of transparency on the EU's part in terms of showing what it wants to do, what it wants to talk about. And even down to some some detail, actually. So one of the first things that the EU wants to talk about are, is citizens' rights mm. and has laid out exactly which citizens should be covered, under what circumstances, what rights and for how long as well. So they want to guard EU citizens' rights in the UK and UK citizens' rights in the EU uh, for their lifetimes. Um, and we haven't had anything like that degree of detail uh, from the UK side. Um, in terms of how well prepared it's possible for us to be, Well, as you say, there's been a great deal of distraction. Mm. Um, There's been a lot going on. The government is in a certain amount of uh, disarray. We've had uh, a general election. We've got a weakened government position. We've got a reconstituted parliament. There's uh, now new voices coming up, uh, strengthening ideas of alternative Brexit. So we're hearing more and more about softening the Brexit that's being planned, possibly looking at the single market and that sort of thing, which which does not give the impression of a unified voice. Uh, It's not clear what the UK team is going in to get, Mm. let alone how they're going to get it. There's what kind of negotiating position is the UK has the UK got? I mean, do we do we even look as if we're strong in these negotiations? Well, it's interesting. There's been an awful lot of rhetoric about strength and not a great deal of demonstration of it. Uh, I mean, we teach negotiating skills at the law school and a colleague of mine said uh, that the government would probably fail uh, their negotiating component of their legal skills module because it's so much about being flexible and open and ready to compromise and not digging your heels in. And the rhetoric that we've had about strength has all been quite bombastic Mm. um, and suggesting that we're going to draw lots of red lines all over the place. And that is, that's problematic messaging on two fronts. It's problematic in terms of the message it sends to the EU Mm. because it, it gives a message of intransigence, of arrogance and potentially overreaching as well and not suggesting that we're, you know, we're ready to think about creative solutions to what is it that we're really trying to get at. And it's not very helpful messaging to the UK as well because it seems if you go in saying, well, we want all of these things and they're all going to be red lines, then it's inevitable that whatever you come back with is going to be less than that. Mm. And it's it's not really managing expectations in a, in a very helpful way. Um, and of course, 
course, it stands at odds with what is actually a relatively weaker negotiating position. Mm. On the point about the, the strength of negotiation, um, it's, it's worth noting that while uh, the minority government seems like it's in a substantially weaker position um, uh, when it comes to sitting at the table with the EU... That's true in some senses, but it's also possible that it will make it harder for the EU institutions to propose something that might look like a bad deal. Because Theresa May, David Davis, will be able to say, in all honesty, I will not get that through Parliament mm. because I don't have a majority anymore. You're going to have to offer me more that's going to appeal to the other parties. And that, you know, that, that might be a virtue. Dr. Charlotte Ryan, thank you so much. That's Dr. Charlotte O'Brien, lecturer at the York Law School and expert on the EU Constitution. Thank you for coming in this morning. And I'm sure we uh, will want you back again and again and again in the coming months to explain how it's all working. Let's get the headlines, shall we?